Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining this first webinar of our new series to kick off the second year of the Grow More Good initiative. So this initiative, as I'm sure most of you know, is supported by the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation and in partnership with NHSA, the National Head Start Association, and Kids Gardening. So this new webinar series is a little bit different than last year's. We're really excited about it. This new year, we will focus on a series kind of focused four different webinars on four different seasonally themed webinars throughout the year. So each of these webinars will include different types of seasonal gardening ideas, including suggested plant lists and some sample lesson plans from the SEEDS curriculum, which we'll talk about in a few minutes and some recipes for young children and families um, that you can make during seasonal produce, um, and then some tips from past Grow More Good Head Start Garden Grant winners. Um, and this webinar today will focus on gardening activities and projects through the fall season. And then as you can imagine, the ones remaining after this webinar will be throughout the winter, um, and then spring and summer. Um, so today we will hear from a few different speakers on the call who will discuss a, a wide variety of, of tips and some best practices for planning and, and planting and maintaining a garden during the fall season specifically, um, along with some information about how to thoughtfully integrate some garden projects into your educational programming. So if you haven't joined some of our previous Grow More Good webinars, I highly encourage you to check some out. Um, I will discuss how you can access those webinar recordings at the end of the webinar. But we also have, um, I'll also share the web webinar registration links uh, for future webinars at the end of the webinar. So if you have not heard me before on other webinars from the National Head Start Association, my name is Sarah Neal, Manager of Effective Practice here. Um, and before we actually jump in, I want to just give a few technical reminders just to make sure we all get as much as we can out of this very quick one-hour webinar. Um, so we want as much engagement as possible on the webinar and encourage you to use that question and comments box that you see on your webinar toolbar. So we will do our best to address these questions throughout the webinar when possible, but we have a dedicated Q&A time at the, end of the webinar, at the end of the webinar. So just make sure you get your questions in before them. Um, but because of the number of people who are joining this webinar, uh, we encourage you to, to use that question box instead of using that hand raising icon that you see on your toolbar, um, just because it will be difficult for me to go through and see who's uh, raising their hands and unmute you. Um, and then I can see all of your questions that come in. And if we do not have the chance to address them during the webinar, we'll have a chance to see them after the webinar and I can follow up with you. Um, so yeah, and we'll, um, I will also have some polls that will pop up on your webinar screen, uh, so please participate in those when they are on your screen, because um, we want to learn from you and, and learn who's on the webinar today. So before diving in, because um, I'm sure many of you on this webinar are new to the Grow More Good initiative, I want to share uh, some, some more recent updates from, from this initiative. So. If you are new, I do encourage you first to, to check out our website. It is on the screen, um, and if you download the PDF of these webinar slides, which is on your toolbar, you can access that link, um, and it's on our NHSA website. It's very Googleable. Um, but just to share a little bit of background, if you're new, this is a three-year initiative in partnership with Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation and Kids Gardening, where we provide garden grants, gardening materials, educational curriculums, webinars, conference sessions, and other resources to Head Start practitioners across the country related to uh, gardening and Head Start programs. So um, this past January, we actually just announced and awarded our first cohort of 10 Head Start programs who won the 2019 Grow More Good Garden Grants. Um, there are going to be two more cohorts to be awarded in this initiative. So in fact, as you probably heard, which we will talk about more later, is uh, the current application for the second round of grants is now open, um, and they're actually due next Friday, October 11th. Uh, so make sure you get in your applications and get started on those if you have not already. And I'll share again a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but before I turn it over to some of our other speakers on the call today, I just want to quickly provide a little bit more information about um, the partners and first starting with the National Head Start Association and kind of our role in this exciting partnership um, in the Grow More Good initiative. So NHSA is a, is a nonprofit organization um, committed to the belief that every child, regardless of circumstances at birth, has the ability to succeed in life. So NHSA is the voice for more than 1 million children, 250,000 staff, and 1,600 Head Start grantees in the U.S. 
and since 1974, NHSA has worked diligently, diligently for different policy changes that ensure all at-risk children have access to the Head Start model of support for the whole child, the family, and the community. And NHSA's vision is to lead and to advocate for children and families across the U.S. to ensure that all vulnerable children and families have what they need to succeed. So along with a lot of our strong advocacy and policy efforts, we also provide six professional development conferences throughout the year, share lots of resources and tools on topics most relevant to our field through webinars and trainings, blogs, and media outreach, um, and also provide opportunities for idea sharing and peer-to-peer -peer learning on our online communities. So one of our most exciting partnerships to allow us to combine all of these efforts and expand our work around nutrition and gardening and overall Head Start Health and Wellness is this partnership with Gottsmere for Own Kids Gardening for the Grow More Good. So this has been really exciting and successful first year and we're excited to continue for two more years. So now I want to share a little bit more information about uh, the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation, um, our funder. Um, they are engaging on an exciting new path to reach more children and families in underserved communities with the materials, uh, with these different types of educational materials and, and gardening curriculums and resources to help children and families build their own gardens and grow their own fresh foods. So one way that they're doing that is expanding into Head Start communities through this initiative, which we are thrilled about. So if you have any questions about the Scott's Miracle Grow Foundation, just let me know and I can connect you. So now I want to go ahead and turn it over to one of our speakers today, Sarah Pounders. Um, she's from Kids Gardening, and um, she's been an amazing partner in this initiative and in providing her expertise through through these different types of um, our, our webinars and our conference sessions about different types of ways that you can integrate gardening and gardening projects into your Head Start programs or ECE programs. So I'm hoping she can share a little bit more background on Kids Gardening and their role in this initiative before jumping in. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. So Kids Gardening is a national nonprofit and our main mission is to both inspire and to provide support for anyone who's involved with youth gardening. So that includes parents, teachers, community volunteers, um, it just anyone involved with kids. We provide online resources, curriculum books, and grant programs. So uh, make sure to check out our website for the full range. And we look at kids from birth all the way to 18. So we have a wide variety. Um, but we're definitely very excited about um, getting to focus on the early childhood ages and because um, you got to start them young to, to keep them going. Um, and so I will just move on. I believe we have a um, quick poll before we dive into the topic today. Yes, yeah, so this is a really helpful poll for us just to see um, who, who all has joined today. I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll so you should see it on your screen now. Um, if your role is not under one of those categories, I would love if you could just add it to the, uh, the question or comments box so I can see who all is on. Great, it looks like a majority of you guys are educators. Um, it's about, so I'm going to go ahead and close this poll in a few seconds so you guys can see. Closing now, and I'm sharing it on your screen. It looks like about 53% early childhood educators and staff, 25% program managers or directors, 8% curriculum specialists, and 3% parents. So glad you're on the call. It's great. And then 13% other. I would just love if you could um, enter um, your role or uh, your title in the question or comments box. That will be helpful for us. And I'll go ahead and move on to the next poll question. Um, do you have a garden in your program currently? Should be launched on your screen now. Hoping to see a good mix here. Let's give you a couple more seconds to fill that out. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close. Sharing on your screen now, it looks like about 27% of you do. That's great. And then 20% 20, 20 have just started which is very exciting. 18% no, not yet, but you're planning one. Glad you're on. And then 34% no, but we are considering one. That's a wonderful mix. So glad you are all on today. Very diverse. All right, I'll go ahead and hide that poll and move on. Great. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sarah to begin the content for the webinar today. Great. Thank you so much. Um, 
So it's exciting to do this this year to focus on the seasons because gardens are so very seasonal. Um, and that's one of the great um, lessons to to learn about the cycles of life and, and, uh, and of nature and to really get the kids observing that and understand how different it is as you go through the year. Um, the challenge then, of course, is that as we go through this, I realize that depending on where you're located in the United States, you may be deep into fall, like getting close to the frost. And then you might be like me, I'm based in Texas and it still feels like summer. So um, as you as you get this information, know that you know you might have to save it for next year or you might uh, have to wait a few weeks before things uh, start feeling like fall. So next slide, we're just gonna dive in. And today I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna be the one to focus kind of on the gardening aspect of it and the, um, the horticulture parts. So I'm gonna kind of give you some suggestions for some cool season plants that are a lot of fun to plant with the preschool aged kids. I'm gonna talk about some season extenders. So some ways that you can get a little bit more growing time out of your garden um, so that you can grow a little bit longer or either start a little bit earlier, depending. Um, some of these work for the spring too, so you can hang on to it. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about harvest and some things to think about. And I'm gonna talk about seed saving, which is another fun activity. And then I'm also gonna talk about some things that you might want to think about as you're wrapping up the garden season and then some additional resources at the end. So we'll just jump right in. And the first thing I'm gonna mention are just some really good plants that you can plant um, at this time of the year. Um, first of all is the greens. So lettuce, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, anything that the cool thing about greens is that you're harvesting the leaves to enjoy and eat. And so you can really harvest at any time. You can even harvest them when they're just a couple of days old and um, if, if you need to. So um, generally you want them to grow a little bit longer, but you can also do microgreens and, and just get them when they're very small, um, but they do really well in the cool seasons. In fact, they do better in the cool seasons. Another thing that's great to grow are cold crops such as broccoli and cabbage. Another great thing are root crops, such as beets, carrots, radishes, turnips. If you have a really short amount of time available, radishes are gonna be the one on that list that you really, it takes about 30 days from seed until harvest, um, traditionally with radishes. So um, maybe not the top of the list for superfoods and fruits and vegetables, but they're a great um, sure thing for your garden, especially if you're getting started and you just have a short amount of time. Another fun thing, and this is what's in the picture here, are sugar snap peas. If you have, if you're in the the southern regions, that they grow well in the fall. They do not do well with frost, but if you can protect them just long enough, they are a lot of fun to grow, and the kids really enjoy eating them and snacking on them. Um, and also herbs, herbs such as dill, cilantro, those are just like the lettuces. They're things that they can enjoy at any time, from the time that they're a little tiny to if you have time for them to get bigger. And um, onions are another thing. So next slide. And definitely um, the next slide is about um, ornamental plants. So I have my absolute favorite plant of all time, which is the pansy, um, which if a plant could smile, that's what the pansy would be. Pansies are a lot of fun to grow with young children because not only are they cute and fun, they do, you can do a lot of craft activities with them too. Another great thing are marigolds. You saw those in, in the last slide. Those are one of my go-tos for the, for the fall months. Calendulas. Um, verbenas will bounce up again in the, the cooler temperatures. Petunias, sweet alyssum. Um, snapdragons are always a lot of fun um, and the kids get to play and kind of snap them open and closed. And then I also put Swiss chard on this list because there are a lot of cool Swiss chards that come in a lot of different colors that are actually just as ornamental as they are fun to grow um, as edible plants. So these are just kind of a few things. There's, depending on where you're located, your list might be a little bit longer, but I tried to kind of share things that are quick to grow and um, do well in the cool temperatures. And if you pair them, what we're gonna talk about next, so next slide, if you can pair them with some basic season extenders, then you can even get extend your season so that you can grow a little bit longer. So basically the soil um, cools down a lot slower than um, the outside temperatures. So if you can find ways to trap the heat, then you can actually kind of help things grow a little longer. Um, and I put here as the very first one, just sheets and blankets. Um, I don't know about where you live, but where we live, we usually will get like one cold snap and it'll just like hit hard and then it'll 
have another couple of weeks where the temperatures are really mild and nice. So if you can just use some basic things like sheets or blankets to cover up your plants for that first cold snap that might hit for one or two days, then you might actually have some additional time after that to, um, so, so don't think it'll be covering them over and over again every night, um, but just to protect them, then it might last longer. Another thing, and this is what's pictured on the slide, are cold frames. And the and these are homemade cold frames that some students made and they used um, milk cartons, as you can see, and they had some um, plastic panels that they put over them. So basically it's kind of like a little tiny mini greenhouse. So you have the glass and it helps trap the, so that the sunlight can come through during the day and trap some of the heat in there. And then in fact, they can get too hot. So you also have to watch out and make sure they're not getting too hot. So that's one of the nice things about having it lower, open and close easily and so and then you can so you have like a little mini homemade greenhouse there's also things like hoop houses row covers and then of course mini greenhouses of all different sizes are fun too depending on where you live some of these might really help you have a little bit longer um, time growing so the next slide is on um, harvest time. So one of the things that I, uh, um, there are a lot of different things that you might've grown over the summer that you might harvest now. And the reason, uh, some of the points that I wanted to make related to harvest are is just to keep an eye on the weather. Just like I mentioned, sometimes you'll have like a cold snap, but it'll be followed by some warmer weather. So you wanna just see if you can protect those things. Another thing is you might wanna think about harvesting early things such as lettuce or kale, things that may get, um, may be okay if it's cool enough, but otherwise you can also still enjoy it even if it's still young and small. So kind of looking out for that. Um, and we also have some information on safe harvesting practices um, on our website where, um, and I'll have, there's a link to that I believe at the end. Um, so just keep those in mind as you get going, but we don't have time to get through it all today. And another thing I wanted to mention um, is that I think some people don't forget your ornamentals in harvest time. So harvesting some flowers, um, some leaves and pressing them um, in a book, in a phone book, if you can find an old phone book. I know not many people have those around anymore, but anytime if you can press them in between two pieces of paper and put something heavy on either side of it, doesn't have to be a fancy press, um, you can use these flowers all winter long. So they dry out between the press, you can use them on cards, you can use them on bookmarks, and they're a lot of fun. You can make them little sun catchers or ornaments. So make sure to think about, like, look around at your, your ornamentals and also think about high, um, harvesting those if, the, if you're going to get a cold snap. So next slide is on seed saving. Kids this age love to save seeds. My son had so much fun picking all of the little pea pods and saving the peas out of there. Um, another cool thing to, to save are marigold seeds. They are just, once they're ripe, there's just so many of them in every flower head because each flower has multiple seeds in it. So just some quick tips, make sure that you harvest on a sunny day and you collect them in paper sacks and label them. The main thing is you wanna make sure is they aren't too wet when you collect them because because they have to dry completely before you store them. So if they are a little wet, make sure you spread them out, let them dry, store them in either envelopes or glass jars, store them someplace where it's, where it's cool, dark and dry. So once again, you gotta keep them dry or else they kind of rot. Um, and I've ad, um, attached over on the handout section, some specific examples and instructions for seed saving um, to give you some ideas of some, some basic things. Um, and also there are some things that you need to leave in your garden so that you can um, get seeds the next season. So some biennials such as carrots or broccoli, you actually have to let them keep growing and they will produce seeds in the next season to come. So next slide. So seed saving is fun. So another couple of things to think about when you're wrapping up the season is first of all, this is the time to write down any things that you can remember from your season, like things that went well, things that didn't go well, things you'd wanna change, because time and time again, if you haven't written it down, I always say that, and then I don't remember it the next spring. So write things down, take the time. It's a great time to also send your thank you notes um, for everyone who helped you out through the year. Not only does that help them appreciate um, let them know that you appreciate what you did for them this year. It also is kind of like a precursor for asking for their help again next spring. So it's kind of like a, we'd love 
to see you see you out there weeding with us again in the spring. Another thing to keep an eye on are end of the season sales. A lot of the stores will be clearing out, making room for Christmas and winter supplies. So it's a good time to keep an eye out for season sales and even donations from places if they have a lot left over. Uh, another thing to think about is your tool maintenance. Before you put everything away for the winter, make sure that you've cleaned things up um, so that everything still is in good ship shape when you open it up again in the spring. So next slide. So another thing to think about, as you're cleaning up your garden, make sure that you remove any diseased plants that you might have. Um, leaf litter also is, is kind of a, it, it can also, it can compost on your, on your, um, on your garden somewhat, but it's also a hiding place for insects. So if you've had any problems with any types of diseases or insects, make sure you to remove all of that and throw it in a compost pile or send it to compost um, so that it, you're starting fresh in the spring. You also may want to look at some methods for protecting your soil from erosion, such as cover crops or mulch. And we have some links. Specific cover crops are basically some plants that will you'll grow and survive over the winter, and it'll keep your soil from eroding away through the winter weather. Um, and also an interesting thing to think about is when you're cleaning out your beds, there's a couple different philosophies. You can actually pull up your plants and carefully kind of shake off the soil as you're cleaning out your beds. You can also just cut your plants down to the, to the ground, leaving the roots in there. And the roots will help stabilize the soil and keep the soil in place over um, the winter. A lot of times that I will do that instead of pulling plants at the end of the season, I'll actually just cut them right down to the ground and let the roots stay there to help stabilize the soil. And also this is a great time to remove some weeds and get after them um, to make sure that you don't have them, have them pop up again in the spring. So next slide. So what I've done here, and you'll be able to click on them, hopefully, um, these are all some articles that we have on our website that kind of give a, a more in-depth information than so many of the things that I've talked about. Um, today so that you can get additional details. And um, I, I just want to leave with the idea that, that fall really is a good season. It's uh, um, I know everybody thinks of spring when they immediately think of gardening, but fall actually can be a great, great season for gardening. Um, you just have to kind of choose carefully, know what your kind of your season looks like and kind of plan around it. Um, and now I will turn it on over. I believe Emily's next to talk about the seeds curriculum. Yeah, hi Sarah, that was a great lead in for some of the lessons that we'll go over um, t together here. Uh, I am hailing from the opposite, the, the northern side of the country. I'm up in uh, Minnesota right now, so we are definitely in the thick of fall um, and it came this week. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to walk you through the architecture of this uh, curriculum that we put together. I am currently at the Minnesota History Center, but at the time of the writing of this, this curriculum, I was with the Smithsonian Early Enrichment Center, which is a lab preschool on the campus of the Smithsonian's in DC. Next slide, please. So the SEEDS curriculum is um, was developed uh, in, in partnership with Scott's miracle Grow uh, Foundation and um, so there are 72 lessons available, and at the end of this presentation, there is a link to those um, lessons, and they are designed for infants through third graders, um, but can really be expanded for any, any age. And so um, these are some of our, our guiding principles as we were thinking about how we, how we put this curriculum together. Um, learning, though not always visible, is always happening. As most of you know, in a classroom and in a garden, things often do not go as planned. So, um, these, so to be flexible and have a sense of fun in how you think about your programming for a garden. Planting and cultivating a garden is believing in possibility. Um, and these lessons are designed to generate excitement about the future. Next slide, please. Um, uh, each lesson has a connection to the greater community. So you'll see that I'll, I'll walk you through two lessons and um, each each uh, lesson at the end has an another activity that leads you out into the gar into, excuse me into the community because um, what we really wanted to show is that the garden is just part of the greater leading, uh, learning ecosystem for children. Um, when a young child's innate curiosity is unleashed in the garden, the possibilities are endless. Um, you can really talk about anything. So um, I don't 
profess to be an expert in gardening, but I do know a little bit about how children learn. And so for me, what was exciting was kind of taking the curriculum and the content from other parts of the classroom and bringing that into the garden. Um, and finally, as you all know, you will get dirty. There will be bugs. Um, my children are definitely in the age right now where they are all about being dirty and, and getting into bugs. Um, and it's wonderful. Next slide, please. Um, we had several guiding questions. Um, part of the joy and and um, excitement and, and difficulty of writing this curriculum was not knowing exactly what kinds of gardens we might be designing this curriculum for um, and knowing that sometimes there would be teachers that would be leading um, the program, sometimes it would be parents and other caregivers. And so wanting to have this be a really flexible curriculum that you could use in the way that best works for you. So we thought about some of these questions. Um, again, seasons like Sarah was talking about, there's no bad season in the garden, there's just different seasons in the garden. Um, um, so what are the skills that we can practice and what would we like to explore thinking about what are we what are we talking about in our at the library and how can we bring that out to the garden um, what are some of the possible outcomes what would you like to do after here and and where can you find other gardens uh, once a kid starts to see growing and living things they'll notice them all over uh, next slide please so um, when you come to the website, you'll notice that the, the, the lessons are really designed around sort of three major areas. There's, there's the ages, so we have the tiny garter, gardeners, um, which are our infants and toddlers, and then you'll have the, the, the six themes. So each age group, um, there's, there's three, uh, three um, modules, if you will. Um, so there's the, the infants and toddlers, and then the pre-K, and then the first through third graders. And so but each, each um, age group has these six main topics. So air, critters and bugs, plants, soil, sun, and water. And within each of those areas, there is a lesson for each season. Next slide, please. So Sarah's um, tips for putting the soil to sleep is perfect for, um, the, so I, I picked some of the lessons from soil. And so we'll look at one lesson for infants and one for pre-K. Um, and so as part of each lesson, um, we had an object or an art piece of art or an artifact that you could look up either on the web or go to the library and get an image of it. And then also some, um, a piece of literature that we could connect, a book to read. And um, so, so the, the images and the, and the book that we had for this um, is this woman here, you can see reclining and the, the theme of this um, is napping. And so we have a nap in a lap is the book that um, we encourage you to bring to the garden. Of course, you could gather these materials before going into the garden or not and do it afterwards or skip it entirely. Next slide, please. These are just ways to extend um, learning in the garden space. So the, the, each lesson has um, a section to think about before visiting the garden, some of the things that you might wanna grab. So in this case, Flaming June, which is that image um, of the woman, and then A Nap in the Lap by Sarah Wilson. Um, and then in the garden, kind of talking about how we're framing the lesson. So here we really did wanna talk about nap time because we know infants are familiar with sleep um, and parents and teachers look forward to that portion of the day when they're sleeping. Um, so talking about how our soil needs a break as well. Um, there's some tips for questions you could ask or things to do. So that's the observation section. Um, what do you smell? How does the dirt feel? I mean, getting getting their hands in this and helping them kind of start to, to, to experience different textures, um, especially in fall when things get crunchy and a little bit um, noisier. That's really fun to, to let a, a, small, a small one get a sense of, of um, all of that. There's the questions to explore. And so again, we're linking this kind of how we're putting the soil to sleep for the fall and linking that to the idea of napping. Next slide, please. Um, and then there's an activity that we can do in the garden. Um, and so one of the, again, one of the I, things that, that we were trying to do with this curriculum was to show how kind of the skills, both um, gross and fine motor skill development and all of those sorts of things can be practiced in a garden space. And so um, I won't cover the activity because it's similar to what Sarah was talking about, about how we can prep the soil. Um, but 
you know, putting their putting their muscles even when they're young to work is, is really great and helps develop those um, the pincher grip that they'll need at some point for writing and um, developing upper body strength and all of that. Um, and then and then the next section is something that you can do outside of the garden. So beyond the garden. So taking a nap or telling a story about nap. And this is just a way to kind of extend the experience back into your classroom, into your house. Um, you could write a book together. I mean, again, these are infants, so you can, infants and toddlers, so sort of adjust for how old they are, maybe just something as simple as reading a book and and, and reviewing what you did um, together. And then um, there's a, there's, you can continue exploring, and that's the area where we put information about another, other places you could visit or other resources that you can um, use. Next slide, please. And I should mention at the bottom of that was also kind of the, the main topics of ecology and gross and fine motor skills, imagination. Those were sort of some kind of big thematic areas that we wanted to pull people's attention towards. Um, here we have the pre-K um, soil lesson. And so again, it's similar content to uh, what we were talking about with the infants, but, but, but directed at a slightly older age. Um, and um, so I will have you go to the next slide, please. This is again, the image and the book that we chose to go with that. Um, so that was the Haystack at Sunset by Monet and then the Three Little Pigs, um, which architectural tale. And I, I do recognize as someone who, uh, I understand that hay is not the same thing as straw, but for children, it's a good visual image for them to, to use uh, the Haystack at Sunset. So. Again, part of what we're talking about here is how are we preparing the garden for winter time? Um, and this, I, I think the other beautiful thing about having children work in a garden is the sense of ownership and the sense of care that they begin to develop for that space. Um, and so this is talking about straw and we're getting a chance to kind of talk about comparing and contrasting um, and Again, that straw and hay are not the same thing. Um, and what does that feel like to feel that buoyancy of when you try to squeeze a piece of straw and it kind of springs back on you. Um, and then having them walk around the garden and sort of take stock of what's there and what needs to be done. Um, can you, next slide, please. Um, it's just questions that you can ask when they have, a, some of, some kids will have, depending on what age group you have, will have a little bit more of an idea about comparing and contrasting to warm weather and cool weather. Um, and again, asking them to think about just, not just the garden, but the other places that they live. Do you see squirrels doing things? You know, what do you notice about animals? Where are the birds going? Do you see them migrating um, up here? My son saw the, the geese heading south and was like, well, it's gonna snow tomorrow, mom. So they are, a, they are attuned to what is happening. Um, activities, again, we can put the, the straw or as Sarah was saying, blankets or something like that to, to provide some cover for your crops. Um, that's something kids can easily do. Um, when you go back into the classroom, you can do some um, painting with straws. Uh, this you want to do probably near a sink um, or a hose, but it's a chance for kids to try to make art with the straws and um, they can, again, the sort of tying activities that were happening in the garden, things they saw before being in the garden, and then things they can do afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, and then we were talking about scarecrows and shout out to kids gardening for some activities there as well. Um, and again, here's where you can see we big theme growing gardeners, which was the age group. And then some of the skills that they're developing observation, their gross and fine motor skills. Um, and so, um, I encourage you to use the lessons as a guide if it's useful to you. The images, if you have a great image that you want to bring into the garden and use that to, to augment the lesson that you're doing or a book that, that goes with it. Um, but overall, the point that we want to make is that it is possible to really explore any topic um, in the garden and to see this as an extension um, of all the great work that you're already doing in the classroom. So next slide, please. So the lessons can be found here at this website, and I'm going to turn it over to our next presenter. 
Thank you so much, Emily. That was that was great. And I just want to make sure that we do share um, your contact information if, if needed. I think it's on one of the slides, and if not, um, my contact information is shared at the end, and I can connect you if you have any additional questions um, for Emily that may not be shared uh, at the end or may not we may not get to at the end of the webinar. Um, so I, now I want to turn it over to Christine Gall. She is the education a education specialist at Kids Gardening, um, along with Sarah Pounder. So thanks so much for for joining, Christine. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, hi, folks. So as said, my name is Christine Gall, and I'm an education specialist with Kids Gardening. Um, beyond my work with Kids Gardening, I am also the Garden Education Coordinator for the Burlington School District in Burlington, Vermont. And that means that I spend about half my week doing gardening, cooking, and tasting activities, you know, depending upon the season, with students of all ages. So a lot of what I'm about to share with you is directly informed by this work, um, which kind of brings me to our topic of discussion. So during this portion of the webinar, I'll be sharing some ideas for tackling um, nutrition education in the context of a fall garden. Um, in particular, we'll be focusing on incorporating fresh garden-grown produce and or seasonal produce into tasting activities during the fall months. So depending on where you are in the country, what is fresh and what's ready to harvest right now will vary, especially if you're thinking about you know, what produce you can get from gardens located at your program site. So for example, um, in areas of the south, like where Sarah is, um, it might have been too hot to maintain a vegetable garden during the summer, so you may have only just started planting your garden, which means that there might not be a whole lot ready to harvest yet. Whereas in areas of the north, such as Vermont, where I teach, like, we're already wrapping up our growing season, and we only have a few types of plants that we're kind of still hanging on. Um, and there are, then, of course, we have a bunch of folks who are kind of in between. Um, so given these two extremes, there are different ways of thinking about using fresh garden produce during fall tasting. So for you folks in northern climates, it's helpful to think about how you can creatively use the produce you still have growing. For example, you may find that as a frost is approaching, um, and you still have tons of green tomatoes on your plants, it may feel really easy to just kind of like give up and let those plants go uh, and pull them out. But instead of doing that, you can harvest all those green tomatoes and create a really delicious green salsa. Another creative example of using kind of the produce that's on the tail end of the growing season is combining kale, which is a hearty cold season crop, as Sarah had mentioned earlier. Um, and you can combine that with your dwindling supply of fresh basil, and you can create a kale pesto, which tastes remarkably like a regular, just straight up basil pesto. Um, now for our garden programs in southern warmer climates, instead of thinking about the produce that you just have a little bit of, you may be thinking more about what you can plant now so that you can use it in the future. So all of those cool season crops that Sarah recommended earlier are some great choices, um, but many of them, they take some time to grow. Uh, so if you're really excited about getting your kids out in the garden, harvesting something and trying it as soon as possible, then radishes and lettuce greens can be particularly good options for you. That's also something that Sarah pointed out. Um, so both of those things are fast growing. You know, radishes, they typically take 28 to 30 days from seeding to harvesting. So if you plant them now, you'll probably have something to taste in the garden in no time. All right, can we go to our next slide, please? So there may also be a bunch of folks here who don't have gardens at their program sites, as we saw from one of our polls at the beginning of the webinar. And if that's the case, then focusing on seasonal produce can be a really great way of connecting just a simple everyday tasting activity to your current season. So as you'll see on the slide, fall is the primary harvest window for a variety of fruits and vegetables. So all of these items should be readily available in abundance at your grocery store. And depending on where you're located, you may even be able to buy these items from a local producer, um, which opens up the opportunity to talk about, you know, if your area is well known for producing a particular type of food um, or to connect with a local farmer. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, 
kind of to wrap up this section, I wanted to share a number of resources with you, many of which directly tie to a few of the points that I just made. So for starters, um, Sowing the Seeds of Wonder is a curriculum that we at Kids Gardening publish with the help of our friends from Life Lab in Santa Cruz uh, in California. And while this whole curriculum contains some really great lessons for young learners in the garden, of particular interest to our current conversation is a chapter with a fantastic selection of harvesting and cooking activities. So if you look over at your webinar control panel, you can actually access and download a PDF of a winter squash tasting activity from this curriculum. Um, and this you know, activity is particularly relevant at this time of year, whether you're in a northern climate where winter squashes are currently being harvested or if you're in more southern climates um, where you can still get this very seasonable vegetable at a grocery store. Our second resource is Chop Chop, which is a wonderful print magazine and online resource. Uh, it has a huge index of recipes, and they range from like, really quick one to two uh, ingredient options, kind of along the line of roast vegetables, which can be great to do in the fall, um, to recipes that are more kind of consu time consuming and complex. And I've included two links to apple-themed recipes, because while apples are easily available year-round, at a national production level, the fall is considered kind of the peak growing season for apples. So this could be a good one to experiment with. Um, both of these recipes are very approachable, not to mention seasonal. Um, if you're looking for something even simpler, just apple slices tossed in lemon juice and cinnamon can be a really fun and engaging way to feature apples during a tasting. Finally, we have our Cooking Matters resource. And this is another online resource, and it's not just for recipes, but it includes some general cooking and nutrition tips. So for example, they have this little article about how to, quote, savor seasonal fruits and vegetables. And I've linked that in the PowerPoint. And it may be interesting um, for you all to check that out and to think about how you can tie seasonal eating to tasting activities year round, not just in the fall. And I've also included a link to a salsa recipe from Cooking Matters, and that kind of ties back to a slide or two ago when we discussed how you might use like the last of your tomatoes in a green salsa. And that's, that's pretty much it. I guess in conclusion, I'd like to say that, you know, many of us, we know that um, getting kids to feel comfortable trying new foods at a young age is a really great way to establish lifelong healthy eating habits. And, you know, it's been shown that when kids have a hand in growing or preparing a specific food, they'll be more receptive to the idea of giving that food a try and then oftentimes giving that new food a positive review. So the more you can incorporate some fresh, kid-grown garden produce into tasting activities, the better. Um, and, you know, if you don't have a garden and can't get something straight from a garden, then getting seasonal produce that you can connect the month you're in um, due to a tasting activity, it creates some additional relevancy and excitement for those kids. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Christine. That was great, especially the resources. I hope those are helpful to everyone. Just a reminder to just make sure you download those handouts before we shut off the webinar today. There's three handouts on your webinar toolbar. So just make sure you go ahead and click over there and download those. And if you have any issues, my email will be shared at the end, and I'm more than happy to just send those to you directly via email. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our friends at Arkansas Early Learning. They are uh, one of the 10 Grow More Good garden grantees from, from um, this previous uh, program year, they have done some really exciting stuff in their very large program in, in Arkansas. They wanted to make sure that that um, their funds that they received from the Garden Grant Award reached as many children as possible, so they decided to um, implement hydro um, hydroponics into their, their program. So I'm really excited to hear um, James and Laura talk about that today. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon. Um, I'm sorry for the absence of my uh, co-partner, Ms. Laura, is not available. She's um, at a center at one of our locations. Well, can you imagine um, carrying a bunch of soil and um, waiting on um, to grow for a particular part of this year? Well, obviously, we did not have that problem because we decided uh, to go a different route, and that was the hydroponic kits. 
So Arkansas Early Learning, um, we had planned to build these hydroponic indoor garden kits so that we can be able to grow all year round. Arkansas Early Learning is a uh, program that services about 1,300 children in the state of Arkansas, so we cover a large territory between northeast and central and northwest Arkansas. And uh, we have um, anywhere between 25 and 30 center locations and also partnerships. And so with this effort, we wanted to um, build these gardens so children can be able to participate in these activities throughout the entire school year and to be able to provide parental lunch and workshops to educate the parents on the various things as it pertains to healthy eating and shopping on the budget. We also uh, worked with our local community partners to engage them with these activities and to provide additional resources and services to be able to uh, serve the children and families of Arkansas early learning. Can I, next slide please. So it took a lot of uh, logistic planning because we wanted to provide this opportunity for the entire um, agency. So we um, we started out with a planning meeting, and that included uh, myself as the community partnership manager, um, along with some of our program relations staff and uh, the our nutrition manager and education staff to get together and brainstorm how we want this to uh, continue on even um, after this first year of receiving the funding. Um, I do want to thank the National Head Start Association, uh, Scott Miracle Grow, and Kids Gardens because they were the ones that provided the uh, funding for these um, for these hydroponic kits, and they um, also provided an um, uh, in-kind donation of other supplies that we are using, uh, that we are ongoing using, that I will talk about here later on. So we decided to get together and decide how we're going to tie the community together, how we're going to engage this into the classroom, and how we're going to uh, have successful build days. Um, National Head Start Sarah provides you uh, with a lot of resources and a lot of different things that she needs that's reported back to her um, on different time frames and deadlines where those resources helped us to be able to uh, work together a strategy. So we wanted to uh, put together a community build day at um, every one of our locations. And at our larger locations, we invited community partners out. And that's where we tied the community back in. Um, at the community fair on the link that you will see provided underneath the community fair build day and the media coverage, that was at one of our locations where we headquartered in Jonesboro, Arkansas. On that day, we invited uh, personnel from like the bank uh, to be able to set up booths at this uh, location. Um, we invited other uh, partners like the library to be able to provide like garden uh, library uh, books, um, uh, healthy recipe books and different things like that. And so we invited uh, many different community partners to come in to set up booths so parents can be able to engage with them and to be able to uh, gain available resources at their fingertips. And from there, we like um, we work with those community partners by scheduling workshops to be able to uh, present to and give the parents the opportunities to engage in. Like with the um, with the bank, we talked about how to eat healthy on a budget. So that's where we implemented two different programs in that workshop to be able to help parents to be able to budget correctly and to be able to eat healthy on a budget. And so we uh, the library. Um, um, talked about library cards, how to sign up for free library cards, and how to uh, utilize their online catalogs, auto books, and different things like that. And so we utilize those community partners to be able to engage further after the build day. And we continue to work along with uh, several other initiatives that we are currently working on now. In the state of Arkansas, um, for every child between the ages of zero to five, we have a one and two initiative that they are in food insecurity. And so we sort of working on, uh, continue on with the same strategy with this, um, with the hydroponic kits to be able to try to uh, provide the parents resources to end food insecurity and to decrease the number across the state uh, centered around that top area. So you can see how this all has started with the initiative of um, eating healthy and staying healthy with the hydroponic kits until now we're building into a strategic program to be able to impact uh, the children's lives and the family and that will later serve the community to decrease the numbers of food insecurity and eating healthy and staying healthy initiatives. So you will see on the link 
uh, provided the media coverage. Like I said, we had the media there that, that day, and um, they also been a part of this focus group that we are uh, working together with these community partners. So um, here soon, we're going to bring uh, those community partners back together to talk about um, uh, food pantry initiatives and fresh fruit produce and different things like that so we can be able to carry on with this, uh, this initiative. Next slide, please. Um, here, uh, these are actually footages that uh, was taken during the process. So you can see uh, that top photo where we was measuring the progress. You see the kids, they was uh, happily engaged. I love the one picture with the uh, this young lady with the harvesting tomatoes. She helped out a big time at that location. And as you can see that uh, the kitchen staff and nutrition staff at that one center, they uh, pick lettuce from what was growing from those products. And, um, and then uh, they made veggie dip uh, with the herbs that came from um, what was produced. And so we uh, interacted with our garden as they was grown, and we utilized uh, those um, those produce into the program. And um, it would just bring great joy when you can walk into a center or when there's a new starter a day or the kid is leaving uh, for the day, they stop by to check out and see how far, uh, how far along it's growing and different things like that. So it was pretty engaging, and it was uh, pretty uh, flashy because the parents would stop as well and check it out. Next slide, please. So, like I, uh, as I previously discussed, we uh, wanted to figure out ways that we can tie this back into the classroom. So we implemented a garden uh, curriculum, and as you can, uh, this is the actual curriculum that we used. Um, Sarah, at the end of this presentation, if you guys have any questions, whatever, Sarah has my contact information. I'd be happy to. Um, talk with you guys about some of the things um, that we use and some of, our, um, um, some of the advantages and disadvantages and different things like that. Well, the USDA education kit that introduced the fruits and vegetables, we utilized that into the program and we had activities for a classroom and at home. Um, uh, when we start talking about the at home, we also um, consider some in kind from there because the parents got to be able to work on some of these activities at home that was tied to the kids um tsg and learning outcomes that was being taught into the um into the program to be utilized at home and can be counted as a um, um, non-federal share match and then the parent communication also included like recipes and different uh different topics and different things like that to be able to educate the parents uh, for their own eating healthy and staying healthy initiatives. Next slide, please. So what did we learn along the way? <laughs> we learned a lot because the first bill day, it wasn't a community bill day. We started one at the central office where the administration is at, where all the managers and directors and the executives are located. And so we learned a lot during that first, that first bill day. And um, I'm still learning because when the uh, hydroponic kit go off, uh, it make a buzzing noise all throughout the office. Then uh, my director, my supervisor would come running looking for me like, that machine is going off again. The machine is telling me to add water. So uh, that was one of the trials that I ran into was the thing beefing off. Uh, I needed to go refill it and uh, to attend to it. Uh, then we also, the plants grow faster than they uh, were suspected to grow. So uh, getting around, pruning those and making sure the, uh, uh, that we we also appointed leaders inside the centers to be able to attend to the needs of the hydroponic kit because uh, it, was, it needed water like once a week or once every two weeks. You need plant food by once every three weeks. And the kits also uh, gave us notification on the screen, which was Wi-Fi based to let us know um, how things was functioning on it and what was needed and uh, what was the attention that was needed to it. So um, the plants would grow faster than expected. So that was one of the things that we learned that we needed to keep a close eye on those. Um, then don't overcrowd, uh, less is more. So um, on each one of the panels, we were able to plant 12 different things and there was two to a kit. So there was 24 different pods that you can plant. And so with that overcrowding, they were, uh, and the rapid growth that was doing so fast, it was, um, it was too much. And then we also had parents are more excited than expected. So, uh, 
that was suspected. And the garden had a uh, common effect we did not expect as well. Next slide, please. As you can see in that picture, that was uh, some of the T-shirts that Scott Miracle Grow uh, provided uh, in an in-kind donation to the agency uh, to provide to the children. And um, and uh, we also uh, included some of the staff leaders to partake in some of those um, those T-shirts. Thank you so much, James. Next slide, um, it's just oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Sarah. No, that's. No, thank you, thank you, James. That's that's really great to just hear about some of your your challenges and successes, and and we just think the the hydroponics idea is so exciting, and that you know we want to spread that idea to so many more Head Start programs. We think it's very um, uh, just a great idea for Head Start programs to reach in any time of the year to reach as much as many centers as possible and as many children as possible. Um, so thanks so much for for sharing that. And yes, um, I will share his contact information for anyone who would like to follow up with him to ask any other questions. So just let me know. Um, but just because we have only a few minutes left, um, I do want to encourage you to go ahead and write in any questions that you may have for any of our speakers today. Um, I see, I don't see many questions coming in right now that are beyond just kind of text questions. So just go ahead and enter your questions now while I go over a couple of um, Last uh, reminders before we close out the webinar today. I do want to remind you that we, if you haven't heard, the Grow More Good uh, grant cycle for cycle two is open now and closes next Friday. So please get your applications in as soon as you can. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm the one who manages that gardens at nhsa.org email. Um, I monitor it closely, especially this time. So please just let me know if you have any questions and I'll get back with you as soon as I can. Um, and just make sure you check out our website if you haven't already. Um, so download the PDF of this of these slides and, and check out our website and, and refer to the frequently asked questions, read through those maybe before getting started. Um, there's a lot of information on our website. There's a few things with the webinars that we need to update, um, but just make sure you kind of go through some of the other information before getting started. And I do want to share that we have the registration links for the upcoming webinars for the other three seasons, winter, spring, and summer. Um, so another reminder, just make sure you download the PDF of these slides so you can access those links. If you have trouble, just let me know. Email is gardens at nhsa.org. And wanted to share the resources on Kids Gardening's website. Um, wonderful resources here. Make sure you also follow that link and maybe review through some of those before even starting your application. Um, or even if you're not planning to apply, maybe go ahead and, and look through some of these resources to be in brainstorming some ways to begin your garden and maybe you apply for next year. So we do have one more grant cycle that we will be releasing next year. And here are just some more websites to follow for more information. Um, again, that's the, the gardens email, nhsa.org. Um, and then we did share some information uh, for National Farm to School Network and Kids Gardening with emails there. But I want to go ahead and move over to some questions as it looks like we're having some in. Um, most people are saying thank you for the great information, so that's great. Um, and then there's some people who are asking again about the funding uh, available for the gardens. Yes, just make sure you check out our website. Uh, grow More Good. If you, if you Google Grow More Good at NHSA, um, you will see our website. Just make sure you go there, kind of explore around the website, and the application link is directly on that website, and it's also on these PowerPoint slides, so just make sure you download the PDF. If you have issues, just make sure you email me. Um, and then there's a couple of other questions um, for, it looks like, James, for you. Um, some people are asking about hydroponics. Was it only indoors? Yes, I believe that all of your hydroponics were indoors. Is that correct, James? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, and then we have another question about the garden curriculum that you were using that you referred to, um, which sounds like it was is really beneficial. Could you share a little bit more about how you uh, heard about that curriculum and where you got access to it? Uh, we did some research uh, according to uh, our needs because we didn't want to put too much on the staff um, um, regarding like um, – the amount of details that it takes, and you know that uh, we wanted to give the um, the kids the flexibility if they choose to engage in the activities or not. So it it, it really depends on the program um, uh, program needs and um, they structure uh, as far as ratio and different things like that, and the supplies and different things like that. So we uh, we was pretty strategic about the uh, curriculum that we did choose. 
And if you would like me to, Sarah, uh, I can share the link with you and you can um, somehow share with um, yeah. the group or whatever yeah, be... of the curriculum mm -hmm. that we uh and it was pretty well, cost yeah, efficient as well. And like I said, we have resources from USDA as well, so which was free. Great, yeah, thank you, James. And we have, you know, all the information with the seeds curriculum and, and all that too. So if I would just encourage anyone on the webinar just to to reach out to me if you have any questions about specific uh, curriculums that we we talked about today. Um, and then I do have another another question that came in. Someone is interested in scheduling a workshop in their community uh, with their school. And I was wondering, uh, Sarah and, and others on the call, could you share a little bit more information about if they did want to get started on having some sort of workshop about, about gardening in their, and building a garden in their school or program, um, what are some essential partners that they should reach out to? Maybe there's a local um, master gardening program or, or maybe there's some, some essential community partners that would be great to engage um, before beginning a gardening workshop like this. Sure, yeah, definitely. Um, Master Gardeners are one that is a good place to start. So Master Gardeners are a volunteer program through your Cooperative Extension Office. And almost every county in the United States has an extension office that's linked to their land-grant university in that state. Um, not all county offices have Master Gardeners, but a lot of them do. So you might want to start with your county office to see if you have a Master Gardener program. There are also a lot of school garden support organizations that work with all ages from the pre-K up to high school. And um, if you email me, I think my email is in this website, um, and tell me where you're located. I can also try and point you in the right direction for that to see if there might be someone in your area that's conducting, um, that I know of that's already conducting some workshops that you could work with. There's also a lot of okay. online webinars too. Um, so if you're in an area that is not, there's a lot of good um, webinars and I can also try and add some links to that. And I will also look at the Grow It, Try It, Like It curriculum that was just mentioned. I can add that to the ECE resources page that we have um, links uh, put together for the, the Grow More Good grant. Great, thank you. That's really helpful, Sarah. Um, so we are at time today. We're a few minutes over, um, which I think is great. We normally run much further than this. So, um, this is great. Receiving no more questions, just a couple of thank yous. So uh, thank you everyone to all the speakers on the call today. I think this was such a great webinar to provide lots of different types of information for, for beginning gardens in the fall season as we're starting to approach warmer, cooler weather. I'm saying warmer because it's still warm here. Um, but yeah. I uh, thank everyone for being able to, to join today. Again, if you have any questions, I believe on the next slide I have my email, if you can just jot down that really quick, I will get back with you to answer your question as soon as I can. It's gardens at nhsa.org. And just make sure you take this last second to download the handouts. Um, any last comments from any of the speakers on the call today? It was, it was nope. great to be on. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. You guys, great. You guys have a good rest of your day. You too.